Because, you know, when anything bad happens, I need more people to blame it on. Today we're going to be talking about the judgment. This is uh, one of the last lessons that, that Christ actually teaches the disciples. I mean, he's going to talk to them still about partaking of the Lord's Supper. But uh, this is the last really big lesson that he teaches them about. And, and what he's mostly talking about when he's talking about the judgment here is how they need to be prepared for those days, how they need to make sure that Christians are prepared for the days of judgment. Because none of us are going to know when that day is. It's just going to happen. And like Roy was saying this morning, it's going to happen in fire. And the first thing that comes into everybody's head is nuclear weapons. You know? And it very well could be. Massive explosions with nuclear weapons. If, if you're, you know, for those of us who are around in the 1950s and 60s, that, that was a real common threat. People were building bunkers in their backyard and stuff. Now we're putting up tornado shelters. Those would have been bomb shelters. But, you know, scientists already know and already agree that at some point the sun is going to expand to the point what happens with a supernova is it, it loses the gravitational force that holds the sun together. And as it does, the sun expands, expands, expands until it explodes. And they know that eventually the sun will expand until it encompasses the area that we're sitting in. So there's another death by fire through natural sources, and we know God's uh, prone to use natural sources. You know, all these people go back and study, and they find, yeah, this really happened, but it was natural. Well, yeah. Who made natural? <laughs> of course, it's natural because God uses natural forces to, to fulfill his will. So we don't know what day that's going to happen, and, and uh, we're not supposed to know. It's supposed to come to us just like it came to Noah, right? But as Roy was saying early, earlier, what a day Tuesday was, huh? Christ was busy. He, he was carrying on verbal duels with the, with the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees and the scribes and, and the, even the, probably with the janitors, but we didn't catch that verse. I mean, he, he about had something to do with everybody, letting them, trying to straighten them out, right? And he's talked to us about loving each other and giving and how much we should give and... and uh, Many parables. We talked, we talked about uh, the parable of the ten virgins. And we talked about the uh, bags of gold. And how we should be working hard to uh, prepare for Christ. We learned about the future destruction of Jerusalem. And uh, right now, the day is getting kind of long for Tuesday. Evening's coming, and Tuesday on the Jewish calendar ends at 6 o'clock p.m. So we're going to start in, into Wednesday at, at 6 o'clock. We're going to learn it. Jesus had to say to prepare us for the second coming. And let's keep in mind that all the time we're talking about this and, and the lesson that Roy was given this morning if you were here for Sunday school class is the Sanhedrin are plotting and planning in the background all this time about how to capture and kill Jesus without causing rebellion. When Jesus comes, verse 31 that young Mr. Keith read for us, when this, uh, he's going to separate the sheep and the goats. Matthew 25, 31 through 46 talks, talks about that, and that's what we're going to concentrate on today. Uh, chapter 
or verse 31 says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. Okay? Going to, going to be sitting on the throne in the sky, coming to judge everyone. Okay? All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd sets the right separates the sheep from the goats. Just like this picture here, you see the sheep and goats are all mixed together. Which is good if, you, if, you're, if you're grazing sheep and goats on a piece of property, they eat different things. The sheep will eat up all the grass, the goats will eat up all the weeds. So a shepherd keeps them together and then at the end of the day, he separates them so that the goats who are pinned up with the sheep don't injure the sheep. Because goats have horns. And they fight all the darn time. Kind of like children. I think we had a bunch of goats at our house. Well, we still do, but they live in the backyard now instead of in bedrooms. But, but so, so he separates them every day. He'll... So all the nations will be gathered together before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. Verse 34, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Okay? So let's hope that we're in that group of sheep. That we're sorted into the right hand. Our responsibility now is to make sure that not only are we separated into the right, but as many people as we come in contact with from now to the rest of our lives are put into the bunch on the right. We have a responsibility basically to everyone we come across and everyone that enters our lives to give them what they need to know so that they may be separated into the right. We need to do that. Verse 35, he, he tells them, you're in the right hand side for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Okay. Have we been doing that? Have you fed Jesus? Have you clothed him? Then the righteous will answer him and say, Lord, when did you see when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? Are you doing that? Are you visiting the sick in prison or, you know, home can be a prison if they're stuck there, sick and ailing? Are you going out and doing that? They don't have to be members of the church for you to do that. That's a good place to... See if you can get them moved into the sheep pen and out of the goat pen. They can't run from you when they're sick. Go visit them. <laughs> Give them a drink when they're thirsty. Give them some food when they need it. Clothes when they need it. Huh? Christ said, the, the king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these, Brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. So, whenever I help someone else, 
I'm doing it for God. You know, it's easy to forget that we do that because right here in these verses, he asked us to. He told us we needed to. Right here. Debbie and I had this motorhome that we brought down from Washington. And uh, the brother of a girl I went to school with was living down at the lake at, at Kerr, on Kerr Lake. Kind of had a tent pitched out in the bushes so he didn't have to pay to camp because there's a lot of it that's abandoned, you know. And uh, so we gave him that place to stay. And he brought some dogs in, and they chewed up the wiring, and they messed on the floor, and, and rather than clean it up, they just threw kitty litter on top of it to dry it up. And, and we had a, a freezer outside, and, and uh, we had butchered about 20 chickens, and they were in that freezer, and all of those disappeared. And, and uh, I finally had to ask them to move on down the road, but... Uh, I was I was pretty upset by about I had given this to this person to help them out and they had destroyed my stuff and stole from me. And I was carping about it one time and a preacher come up and he said, Aren't you glad you were doing it for God and not for them? And you know really that's right. When I do those things, I need to be doing them for God. And I need it, if I need to give somebody something to help them along, why should I worry about what they do with it? All right? I need, to, I need to give freely and realize that, yeah, once in a while, they may do something I don't like, but I didn't do it for them. I did it for God. And don't, you know, once I give it, don't worry about it. It's gone. It's theirs. Do with what they want. But I get to feel like I did what God wanted me to do. So give freely. Always give freely. And that, Debbie and I have kind of tried to make that a policy. And you know, it, it feels good in your life when you hear your kids talking to each other. And you hear them say, well, well, they just like to give stuff away. And, I, and Debbie and I get to think about, yeah, we just like to give stuff away. We do it every chance we get because it's become a habit. And I hope, I hope God sees that. I know he does. We, we went out and got 20 chickens, so we give eggs away. No way we can eat all the eggs we get. So we bring them here. We grow a garden. We always plant extra plants so we can give our cucumbers away and our peppers away because it just feels good to give. That doesn't mean, you know, I'm not saying we're all that great. I'm saying it's just, it's easy for you to set your life up as a giver. It's easy to find ways of giving things to people. Okay? Will they always appreciate it? Maybe not. But if they're hungry, you can give them some food. And once you're hungry and somebody gives you food, you appreciate it. So try to find ways of giving to your brothers and sisters and to, the, and to those that are outside the church because it just might be a way of getting them inside the church. That's why we have the little box out here. That people can come and get. That's a blessing. You know? We used to give away lots of, of food and things, but uh, we don't have that many people calling and asking for those. But now we have the box. We'll get you some out of there. We love you. Here, take this. What, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers or sisters of mine, right? They're God's children. 
you did for me. Then he will say to those on the left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire pre prepared for the devils and his angels. Okay? There's a lot of people that they, they seem to have it in the head that we have a lock on everything because we're going to live forever. You know? We have eternal life as long as we do what God asks us to do. But you know what? We have eternal life if we don't do what he asks us to do too. The difference is we can go to heaven or we can go to hell. And it's not even hell. It's worse than hell. I mean, have you ever just burned your finger with one little match? Dropped a hot coal from the campfire on your foot or, or, or been a welder and had one of those go down inside your shoe? <laughs> And you think of how bad just a little bitty tiny bit of fire is. What's it going to be like if you're surrounded by it? You're living in it. Burning forever and you never burn up. You just keep on hurting. Okay. So he's, Depart from me you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for de the devil and his angels. It tells you right there. It's an eternal fire. You're going there forever. You're going to suffer forever. You're going to burn forever. If you're one of those goats. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. They didn't give. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. Okay. There's a lot of people out there that need looking after, that need to be invited in. They need, they need to come and share our house, this place that God has given us to worship him. They need to be a part of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. We need to be the ones that bring them there. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? I, I put that picture there of the marching Muslim radicals because I wanted to point out this is a Christian thing, this giving. Have you ever seen a Muslim food bank? A Muslim clothing giveaway? They don't do it. Okay. We are required to. He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. He will reply. So he's going to answer us with his actions. Right? He's going to tell us what, we, what we're doing wrong. He expects us to do that because all of the people that we encounter are Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? Every time we do something bad to somebody, it's just as if we did it to him. Every time we don't help somebody, it's just as if we're not helping Jesus. We need to keep that in mind always. That we need to be willing to give. And we are. We send money to India and we send money to Truth for Today to get the word out. But we have a lot of people around us too that we need to be tending to. So whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. 
When you're dealing with people, deal with them as if you're dealing with Jesus. Treat them with love and affection like you would him. Treat them with forgiveness. That's the hardest one. Because people do stuff to us our entire lives. And we need to forgive those people because if we're, if we're carrying that hatred in our heart or ill will towards them, then it's just going to fester inside of us and we're not going to get the glory that we deserve. No, we will get the glory we deserve. I guarantee you that. We'll get exactly what we deserve. Let's just make sure we deserve eternal life with Christ. He tells us how, plenty. The, the, the other alternative, of course, is then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Okay? Down at the bottom of this fiery pit is what you're looking at happening if you're not right with God. That's where a lot are going to go. That's where he's going to send all the goats to. All right? Now, everybody said, you mean when we die and then we got to come up out of the grave? No, no. The righteous are waiting and the unrighteous are waiting for Christ to come again. And when he comes again, they shall all rise, bad and good, and then they will be separated and judged with the rest of the world. And it's going to happen that fast. So when Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples, as you know, the Passover is two days away, and the Son of Man will be hand handed over to be crucified. He's still trying to make them understand. And this is the first time he's really said, this is what, what's going to happen. This is how it's going to happen. He's told them that he was going to be taken away from them, but now he's getting down to the nitty gritty and telling them this is how it's going to happen. And the whole time he's talking to them, what's going on? The plotting and the planning. Right? They're looking for ways. At this time, you know, Christ, Christ rested, but his enemies did not. His arrest is, would be a big problem for the Sanhedrin. How are we going to arrest this guy? They were afraid to arrest him in public because after the triumphal entry, they were afraid it would cause riots and they themselves would get injured. And they were un, un, unable to catch him in private. They couldn't find where he was to get him. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and they schemed to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him, but not during the festival, they said, or there will be a riot among the people. That's Matthew 26, verses 3 through 5. Then Judas Iscariot, this is Mark 14, 10 through 11, then Judas Iscariot, one of the... Twelve went to the chief priest to betray him. And they were delighted, boy, what a good deal this is, to hear, hear this and promised to give him money. So he watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over. But it's all part of this. Everything we've been covering in this whole series for almost a year is all a part of this. God's plan of salvation. It all leads to that. Christ has to go. They're still not quite convinced. They still want to believe that he's here to deliver them. And at the end, you know, some believe and some don't. What 
What, <clears throat> what we need to keep in mind all the time is that this plan of salvation was put together before man walked on the earth. Christ was here. Christ was the word before a man walked on the earth. The plan was here all along. And we live under that plan today. We still need to work for God's plan and God's will today. Always put God's will first. Every, every prayer you hear in this place says God's will be done. Your will be done, Father. His will will be done for our eternal salvation. His will will be done for the eternal damnation of those who refuse to listen to his word. As we prepare for the plan of salvation, here's what you need to do. You need to hear the gospel. You can hear it as I preach it, or you can hear it by opening up the book, or you can hear it by talking to other people. Are we making sure other people are hearing the word? Are we spreading the word? with our mouths and with our books and most of all with our actions? Do people see us and say, those, those silly Christians, they just walk around with silly smiles on their face because nothing phases them because God's taking care of them. If the worst thing you can do is kill them, they're just going to live forever. So there's nothing this earth can do to me, nothing this earth can do to you. As long as it's in accordance with God's will, your salvation is assured as long as you look to do that will. You have to believe the words you hear. You have to live the words they hear. You have to act upon them. You have to repent of your past sins. One of the, one of the things I said a while ago, it's hard to forgive people sometimes. If you're carrying a grudge in your heart towards another Christian, you're not going to make it. Okay? Because you, you, can't, you can't take communion properly when you're carrying sins in your heart. Okay? You have to repent of those sins every day. You have to stay with God. And that's the big one after you're baptized. Keep Repenting of your sins. Because you're not going to just quit doing things wrong. You're still going to sin. But you're going to be a lot faster to recognize that what you just did is a sin. And as long as you're also just as fast to repent of it or try to make amends to whoever you trespassed against, then you'll be okay. You have to confess your faith in Jesus Christ. Not just here. Everywhere you go. When you're sharing the word of God out in the community, you're confessing that faith in Jesus Christ. Okay? And that's what he said when he's talking about the sheep. When I was sick, you tended me. When I was hungry, you fed me. Right? That's confessing Jesus Christ. Right? You're doing what he wants you to do. So when you do those things, when you spread the word... You're, you're doing that. You're confessing the faith in Jesus Christ. You're showing, this is how I live my life. We had a young man come visit us one time, one of Debbie's uh, nephews. And uh, he came down, he had, he had killed a man in his living room. Self-defense. But he was going down the wrong path. I think he was selling cars that didn't belong to him, you know. 
but they came down and and spent a couple of days with us after you know after he had done this and they're getting ready to leave and we walked out to the truck he says nothing bothers you does it I said no I have no reason for anything to bother me I said that's what a faith in God does for you it tells you everything is going to be all right it's because it's the way God wants it and I said you put your faith in God, and you can walk around smiling like this, too. And I figured, well, maybe I am doing it a little bit right anyway, because he could see it on the outside. And if you're, if you're a Christian and you're living your faith, people can see it on the outside. Just by the things you do, the things you say, the things you listen to and what you allow to enter your life will brand you as a Christian and they can spot it. You're, you ever been around a bunch of people that smoke marijuana? You know, go up to the lake sometime, you can smell that stuff floating around. And there'll be people that were total strangers. Ten minutes ago, huddled together, smoking on the same cigarette in the middle of the COVID. You know? Because they can spot each other a mile away. But if you're living a Christian life in a Christian way, following the rules that God has laid down for us, they can also spot you a mile away. Some of them will turn and run, but not all of them. So the ones that don't get away, talk to them. Make, let them see a Christian so they, to the point that they say, oh, man, there's a Christian, run. No. Let them see a Christian to the point that, uh, so I want to be like them. I want to have that smile on my face. I want to know everything's going to be all right in my life forever. I want some of that. Make them want some of that. Then you drag them in here and we'll baptize them. All right? Because that, that has to be done too. Hear the gospel, believe the gospel, repent of your sins, confess the faith, and be baptized. If any of you need to do that today, don't wait. It's your soul. Remember the rich man that put, built all the big barns to hold all of, his, all of his riches and then God told him, you fool. Your soul will be asked to you tonight because you don't know when it's going to happen. Could be a car wreck. Could be lightning strike. Could be a shooter. Or it could be something natural. You don't know when God's going to require you. So don't postpone what is required to save your soul. If you need to do that today, please come as we stand and sing.